Unfortunately, we have some time, so we can hear uh, Jack Elias and Jurgen Baer are the session summarizers, and it looks like Jack is walking up there first. So, is that your is that your plan? That's the plan. Please, please go. Ahead. Please go ahead. Um, so, uh, first off, let me uh, compliment the organizers and thank the organizers for inviting us. This is truly a wonderful venue and a wonderful meeting so far. It's hard to imagine that an earthquake took place here just a little while ago. Uh, so really, uh, kudos to, to the organizers. I also want to echo the comments uh, of, that were made this morning. It's very hard to summarize an afternoon of excellent science uh, and uh, try to say anything intelligent after this time point. I am looking right at Jeff, though, to make sure he stays awake. So uh, <laughs> that, that, that is the, the thing. And, and it's very hard to, to say anything when Marvin's sitting here being grumpy the whole time, <laughs> but uh, we'll do our best. So let me start off with uh, the presentation by Dr. Uh, Ro Rosas and, and, and colleagues. <clears throat> it's a very excellent uh, presentation. It points out uh, the whole issue of is there a phase of the disease that, that we really haven't paid attention to? Uh, is, is there an earlier form of the disease that is somehow uh, either opening up a window that's been closed to us up till now? Uh, is there something special about the early disease that will give us uh, the ability to find pathways that are critical uh, and to find drugs that are uh, actually therapeutically effective if we can diagnose the, these patients earlier? Uh, very, very nice uh, 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 tie into the, uh, a, the asymptomatic aspects of collagen vascular disease, the importance of obesity, uh, the importance of the preclinical phase uh, in families uh, and uh, many speakers during the course of the day have, have really broken down the barriers between pulmonary fibrosis and emphysema uh, over and over again uh, during the day. Uh, the big questions, and they were highlighted but this morning, is is the early phase of the disease in some way <clears throat> important because it progresses and you really need to know if it progresses? Uh, does it represent a similar process or a mechanistically different process? I happen to be one who, who is concerned, uh, interested in the idea of a multiple hit hypothesis for this disease and is there another hit that takes place that gets you into the second aspect of it? Uh, uh, and so uh, the whole issue of susceptibility to therapy uh, jumps in. Uh, let me move to the, uh, the, the uh, presentation by Tatler and colleagues, which showed a, a very nice a mechanism for TGF beta stimulation of alpha V beta 6 uh, going in a positive way through SMAD3 and inhibiting through ELK1. Uh, this is intriguing in a number of ways. Uh, the, I just kept sitting there saying, wow, there's the positive feedback loop. Uh, we have a chronic progressive disease, and we need to know what, what, what the positive feedback loops are. This is a potentially a very exciting one uh, in this process. Uh, and the other thing that's really interesting is that if people describe IPF as being geographically and temporally heterogeneous within a single biopsy, and the heterogeneity that we're seeing in the reporter assays really suggested that there are multiple different insults at different times uh, during the course of the disease. Uh, the paper by Lee et al. was, was a wonderful paper as well. Uh, it really showed the very nice relationship between telomere length uh, and uh, uh, the definition of transplant-free survival. Uh, I was intrigued by a number of things. First of all, if I was intrigued that she's got a colleague who now has a company that is doing uh, everybody's telomere length so everybody can get their blood drawn out in the hall and we'll all have our telomere length by, by the end of today. Uh, uh, and so that begs the question of if and when, what will be needed to, to make this clinically useful if it can be made uh, clinically useful. Uh, but I think the, the other bigger issue or equally big issue was the issue raised by Moises, uh, and that is what is the mechanism that links a short telomere to a, a bad outcome? Uh, and I would love to know that, and I think everybody else in the room uh, would love to know it as well. And the, and the last one I'm going to review is, is the one by Shea and colleagues, uh, and this is a, a very interesting paper where they took the sphingus in one phosphate system, uh, and they were able to... Uh, developed this two-hit model where they uh, uh, diminished uh, uh, sphingus and one phosphate uh, uh, in, in hip inhibition and in that setting gave low-dose bleomycin and they got fibrosis and then they showed uh, the thrombin dependence of the process. And it's a very, very, very interesting paper. Uh, it it t ties uh, 
uh, leak to fibrosis. In my mind, maybe appropriately, maybe inappropriately, it ties it to injury. And I think there's one thing we've been doing at these meetings all along is we haven't focused on injury as much as we focused on fibroproliferative repair. Uh, and I think injury is a critical process uh, uh, in this process. Um, and again, it, it fits into the concept that we may have uh, a multiple hit disease here and the hits in different people may be different uh, at different places. Uh, so let me stop there. Uh, and let Jurgen uh, do the others. Yeah. Thank you, Jack. And uh, so my task is to report about the three remaining articles. And I think what I want to say, and I will be brief, they all are in common or have in common that they deal with the heterogeneity of the disease, with phenotyping of IPF patients, and with targeted, tailored treatment approaches. So the first... Um, so, <laughs> any comments? <laughs> no, it's just, no, Marvin. It's Marvin. a very common theme. And I, yeah, true. It's one I had maybe 30, 40 years ago. So, no. nevertheless, I think we had made, nevertheless, we have made some uh, progress in this. And Donnelly and, uh, pr uh, introduced to us the concept of the TLR3 um, aberrant activation due to a, a gene polymorphism which blunts the uh, reaction and, and interferon response in the presence of the CC phenotype. And I think this was a very interesting finding which showed us that uh, a patient cohort of 12 to 49% uh, really expresses a progressive disease phenotype which could be addressed specifically with new treatments. The second paper by Dr. Chen from Seattle, he told us about the lysyl oxidase like two levels as a serum marker for disease activity. And again, this is a, a marker that is also connected to disease pathophysiology. And uh, there is a specific blocking antibody for this marker. And uh, Dr. Chen quite elegantly showed that uh, the bio, uh, the, the levels in the serum of these of uh, patients with IPF, and it was a um, proportion of the Artemis IPF data bank he, he had to investigate, 67 zero, he could show that a high level of this um, enzyme, LOXL2 enzyme in the serum was associated with a higher progression of the disease, so uh, faster decline of FEC, more hospitalizations, and there was also a trend or higher mortality. And of course, it would be very interesting whether this blocking antibody GS6624 could be a specific treatment in such patients. And finally, Dr. Antonio, she reminded us uh, that the citrullination and autoimmunity system may be also associated with uh, cigarette smoking, and she elegantly showed that this is active as well in rheumatoid arthritis patients and in IPF patients, and that there may be some overlaps between these entities in, in terms of activation of the citrullination pathway. And while the, the data, of course, we could debate long over, I think it is an important message that we have to take into account also in IPF patients that autoimmunity phenomena may be uh, associated and may have a part in this disease. And this is, I already stopped, and thank you for your attention. Thanks. So, um, so would anyone care to address uh, any of the points raised by the reviewers or any of the speakers? Um, yes, sir, please, David. We have a uh, microphone over here. Dave, come up here. Go ahead there, Dave. Come right here, Dave. I think one of the themes that is overwhelming is the, this issue of heterogeneity. And I'm just, uh, given that we have a, um, an audience from industry and pharma and, and academia, I was wondering what kind of recommendations we have for pharmaceutical trials given the heterogeneity that we're seeing in IPF. Who wants that one? 
I think it's for Marvin. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I mean, what I got excited about when you said that, Jurgen, is, is I completely agree with you because I've, I've, I mean, that's, that's the whole point, but we have a lot of potential markers now, uh, some genetic, uh, some, some proteins, uh, and, and these patients may be completely different, even though that clinically may have some similarities uh, in their disease. You know, I, I, I think the other point is, 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 you know, there's no question age is important in UIP. There's no question. And sex is important in UIP. Race is important in UIP. At least in our country, you know, in African Americans, we don't see uh, very much, if at all, UIP. And often when we do see what we think is UIP, it turns out to be eventually there'll be some connective tissue or autoimmunity issues involved. So, uh, but the disease is, is common in Asians. It's certainly common in, uh, in, in all Europeans and, uh, and in, in Hispanics. So I think that we're really dealing with a disease which is not one disease at all. And, and, uh, and therefore, the, 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 the uh, therapeutic directions should be based upon uh, uh, the heterogeneity as opposed to looking for one common. And I always say, and, the, and it's never reported, but if you look at every single trial, and I'm sure this is true, although I don't know it, but I'll say it anyway because I don't care if, if it's true or not, <laughs> is that I'll bet you in every single trial, that there were people may have been misidentified for one reason or another, but they were close enough that these people did show some response to the therapy, which may be, which may have been very beneficial, and, and because the overall statistics uh, didn't come out that way, these drugs were dropped, and I suspect that one day we'll be bringing some of these drugs back. Jack, um, to, to to go with. Well, um, I, I agree with a lot of what Marvin just said, but to go a slightly different direction, I think all the we're going to have to be stratifying the patients as they come in based on what we know, and I think we know woefully little, but we do have some markers now that seem to correlate. The other thing, though, is to take the periostin story in IL-13, and they, you know, is you, you have to develop the biomarkers of efficacy and intervention based on the drug that you're trying to develop. And you, you look at the folks who did that, they developed their own set of biomarkers. There was nothing intuitive about what they came up with. Uh, and they came up with, an, with, a, with a marker that allows them to get a subset that seems to respond a little more favorably. And so I think it's going to be a combination of using what we have and actually developing the biomarkers that we need uh, for a given intervention to try to be sure that we can get the right subpopulation of patients to be looked at in the correct statistical and clinical way. Okay, so that was an excellent session.